Hello, welcome to Free Will Science and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs, and today I'm here with George Ortega, Jamie Soden, um, Will, and today the topic is the difference between determinism and fatalism because a lot of people get really confused because they say, well, if we have no free will and if everything, you know, is, ca is caused, then why do anything, you know? And they say, and they, they're getting all confused because they think, because fatalism is so different from determinism because fatalism is like what you do doesn't even matter. Things are fated to happen regardless of what you do. Whereas determinism is that things are fated because you do them, because you were caused to do them by prior causes. So there's there's a difference there. Uh, I have on in my web browser, I have um, Trick Slattery's infographic. And so um, what I was thinking of doing is starting out by looking at reading this on the left side it has um stuff that's true of determinism and then it compares it to fatalism on the right okay so so guys would you like me to start reading that go ahead you go ahead no problem all right determinism is dependent on causality fatalism is not dependent on causality determinism the future is a is is a, is is a causally determined. Dude, he did a typo. Yeah, the future is causally determined. Fatalism, the future is fated or destined. Determinism, what we think, say, and do is part of the causal process. Fatalism, we are fated regardless of what we think, say, or do. Determinism, does not lead to defeatism as our conscious thought and action leads to future events. Fatalism, often leads to defeatist attitudes as what we think or do doesn't matter to a faded future. Determinism, we have an effect on our future outcome. Fatalism, we are powerless to affect our future. Determinism, often a secular understanding of causality. Fatalism, often a religious idea of, of being fated by a deity or God. Determinism, Causality and what it implies can be logically inferred. Fatalism, no logical evidence for fatalism. So yeah, that's the really good comparison there is that they're so different and yet people get them confused. And I understood, like personally, I understood the difference between determinism and fatalism, like really quick, because I already, I was familiar with Calvinism. Calvinism, for example, well, God has predestined you to heaven or hell, or, you know, and you can do nothing about it. Um, you know, so I got that, which, of course, that predestination has nothing whatsoever to do with life on this planet now. So Calvinism is completely useless anyway. But I got the idea, well, God has decided what to do with you, and nothing you say or do matters. And so fatalism is feeling like, Dude, nothing I do makes any difference. Um, but determinism is like, it, uh, yeah, and determinism is like, well, what I do totally makes a difference. And we know that. We know from experience that, that, we, that what we do makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, Chandler, that's, that's, that's the key. That's the key. In other words, a fatalist, the other part of a fatalist um, concept is that like, that not only is everything predetermined, but we already know has, how it's going to turn out. Or, well, actually, that's part of it. Sometimes, for example, like, you know, if we're going to take a test, you know, under the fa fatalist condition, it says, well, you know, um, it's already faded whether how well we're going to do or not, so it doesn't matter what we do. Um, no, it's, it's just not logical. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, fatalism is so weird. And... Another thing that people get so hung up on is that the future is fixed. Like they think that, that things are predestined or predetermined, so nothing makes any difference. And what they just don't get it is that things can still be predetermined and there being only one outcome um, in the universe, uh, one causal outcome, you know, under determinism. In, but instead of fatal, fatalism and determinism both share that in common, but the, it's about the reason why the future is, de, is determined. 
know? I do get what you're saying. I mean, the difference between yeah. fatalism and determinism, like, um, that their very meaning, is that fatalism, the, you know, the, f- the future is already known by at least one person. Whereas with determinism, we don't know what the future is going to be until the future event happens. Yeah. And it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't take away from the experience, just like watching a movie. Sure, it's already pre-recorded and made, but it's still new to you. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. I, think, I think the advantage of understanding that everything's determined um, to a great extent comes after whatever's happened has happened. In other words, like, let's say we're studying for a test and for whatever reason, we don't do as well as we would have liked or whatever, right? Then, in hindsight, we can say, say, well, you want to know something like, and let's say we studied, you know, we were confident we studied enough. We can say, well, you know, it wasn't up to me. That was faded, you know, because it already happened. You know, we did a certain, you know, we, we did. Um, and so, but like, so we use it to kind of like to not blame ourselves wrongly for what has happened. But again, to, to say to ourselves before like a test, well, you know, I'm not going to study because it won't matter whether I study or not because the outcome is faded. No, that, that, that just shows uh, a lack of understanding that even though everything is determined, what happens um, is determined by various, you know, by what happens by, by various causes. Yeah. And another thing that's important, important to know, George, is that under fatalism, um, God might know the future if God is omniscient and God exists and all that, but there's no way for us to predict it. No way at all of predicting the future and knowing what's coming. But under determinism, because everything does have a cause, we can make predictions of what will happen. Have you ever watched other people and you know what they're going to do? You know what they're going to say. You totally know the outcome and you're right like 90% of the time. I mean, I do that. Like, I do that. I, I predict what someone's going to do, and I'm almost always right because I know their character. If I know that person, I know their preferences. I know their desires. And so I know that they – unless something major happens to cause them to change, they do the same thing over and over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The thing about quantum mechanics is that people keep on confusing, like, um, lack of predictability with uh, true randomness. Um Lack of predictability means we're unable to predict certain things due to our limitations. Whereas with true randomness, it's impossible to predict, you know. Yeah. That's a great point, Jamie, because like what people who invoke quantum mechanics don't get is that like we make amazingly accurate predictions with quantum mechanics. You know, we just rely on probabilities mm-hmm. instead of direct measurement, which, which you know, but, but again, we, we can, I think, predict much more accurately with quantum mechanics and I think than we can with, with classical mechanics. So, so we, we certainly can predict. Yeah. But the thing is with quantum mechanics is that um, some people use that as a defense for free will. Like with Michio Kaku, for example, he made, uh, he made a huge assumption about this. And I'm, I'm thinking, how the hell does that defend, um, you know, free will? How does that make free will possible? Because randomness cannot be controlled by anyone can it <laughs> nope no randomness technically means like in the strong sense that something is happening without a cause and that doesn't even make sense conceptually how can something happen that's not caught that it's not caused to happen yeah randomness is perception I've, I've always said this you know randomness is what we perceive you know it's because we can't predict certain things that things are random, random to us, you know, but our eyes can be fooled. I mean, for goodness sake, optical illusions fool our eyes sometimes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That, you know what that, Jamie, that just caused me to think of something. The, the, the illusion of randomness, because you know what? Um, that is sort of, uh, that's an illusion right there. I mean, this whole idea that things are truly random but because that because it implies that they have no cause and and when people say talk about you know random acts of kindness you know that like what you know what do you think they mean by that you know like people yeah yeah because chandler i mean random has several meanings and that's part of the confusion in other words like if i have a deck of cards and i present them to you and i ask you pick a card out at random 
it, it means that I don't want you to like count from like one one end and you know what like it means like I want you to do it without thinking about it right without any kind of plan now certainly in that sense randomness makes sense or or like another use of random is like well these particles are behaving randomly like Jamie was saying meaning that we don't have enough information about how they're behaving to predict what they're going to do or even to understand why they're doing what they're doing so yeah. so I mean, yeah go take ahead, a roulette wheel, wheel for example I mean on a roulette wheel right a, a ball is going to land on a specific number isn't it you know to us it'd be random but the thing is if you if you tilt the um, roulette wheel even slightly that one number is going to be, you know, become more pr probable than the other, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And and the other thing. Pretty much. Oh yeah. And and will like the and the the roulette wheel everything fine. We may not be able to determine, you know, all the forces that that cause that that number to to, to come up, but we know that the laws of phys physics were completely determining it. Yeah. And 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 here's a an interesting example of a brain fart. Okay. Because there's this compatibilist who comments on my blog sometimes, and he says that it doesn't matter if if somebody can predict your your choice, your decision, or whatever, because you still freely chose it, even though they knew what you were going to do. And that's what's so bizarre about it is that some is that somebody admits that somebody can know what someone will do. But it doesn't matter because for he, he's changed the definition of free will. That if no human is holding a gun to your head, then you have free will. You know that's kind of his definition. Yeah, but that's poor reasoning, man. Because we know by you know neuroscientific facts that brain damage of certain kinds can alter people's behaviors. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys um, I had a, the chance to see that that four minute clip of the video that I sent on the last email. But like, if you'll notice, the neuroscientist is explaining, no, I'm sorry, free will is an illusion. Then Bill Nye, the science guy, says, but wait a minute, like, because then she started explaining the Labet experiment, what, where the researchers know what the person's going to choose before they choose it. And then Bill Nye goes, but wait a minute, it's still the brain that's deciding and we're the brain without understanding that we're not the part of the brain that controls what the brain does. <laughs> oh it's, man, I mean like Yeah, you know what, George, that's about the same as saying that your butt has free will because it, your butt farted and even though it was causally determined that you would your butt would fart, it was still your butt farting. I mean seriously, that is what it sounds like. Yeah, and 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 the question, you know, guys, I mean the question is like these guys, not him also like um Neil deGrasse Tyson, so many, like Michio Kaku, so many of these guys, like, how do they get to be PhDs? This is basic thinking. This is basic elementary logic. How do they not get this? I'm really dis. I'm. I, They're George, talented. I am really disappointed in Bill Nye. I'm really, really sad because I thought I, after watching the Ken, Ken Ham and Bill Nye debate, I thought Bill Nye knew what he was talking about, but now I don't know anymore. <laughs> And after finding this out, man, I'm, I'm really disappointed in um, Michio Kaku, man, because I used to look up to the guy, but when he um, used quantum mechanics to defend free will, I was like, you do realize that free will is, in, is inconsistent with evolu evolution, right? And, and, and Michio Kaku, he said the particle is multiple locations at the same time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And and I think I think um um Neil deGrasse Tyson said that particles pop in and out of existence. I mean like they do they appear to, but I think you know considering that we can only perceive 4% of the universe and the rest of the universe is dark matter and dark energy, we know it's there. It's 96% to say something's popping in out of it's popping in and out of awareness. So so again like yeah, to for for these guys to, to make these logical kinds of like mistakes, you know, profound mistakes, we have to conclude that so many people who, who we, you know, tend to think are like good scientists, very intelligent scientists, what they're good at is not thinking they're good at learning. They're good at reading a book and understanding what, you know, kind of understanding what's said and then remembering it, you know, but yeah. they're, they're definitely not good at understanding what they're, they're reading. But if a biologist Richard Dawkins can accept that free will is an illusion, surely um, other scientists should be able to accept it too, right? 
Yeah, and, and, you know, Chandler, Will, you know, Jamie, and this is the big question because, like, we get we get um, how free will is impossible. And so, like, you know, that's no mystery to us. That, that's, that's even so very basic. So, now, you know, our challenge, we have two challenges. One, how do we get them to understand, you know, this very simple logic? And then the second question is, like, how do they not get it? How is it that their emotions, their beliefs, whatever, something is not allowing them to get it? Well, you know, George, here's what's so interesting is that you have people who accept the theory of evolution and understand the causal mechanism for why things evolved to be a certain way. Um, but then they still believe in free will. And I really don't get that. Now, Jerry Coyne understands that free will is an illusion. He totally gets it. He writes about it on his blog a lot, you know, and like Jamie Soden said, Richard Dawkins gets it. But yeah, like, what is it? These people... Something keeps them from getting it, and perhaps it's the compatibilists that are confusing them. Yeah, Will, well, go ahead. Well, there's, there's a lot to it because you say everything, um, not everything, um, you say free will is an illusion, just like you know, um, capitalism and everything. But it's just that you know, if you tell them these things, they just don't want to wake up to it. They just, I don't know, maybe because they're not used to it. They're not uh, used to the truth, but then again, people never did like the truth. But they, yeah, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> and, yeah. In fact, I've been, stuck, yeah, I've been reading that book by James B. Miles, and he talks so at length about why people, um, even those who know that free will is an illusion, want to keep people ignorant. Yeah, well, especially well, yeah. the companies. They want to, um, they want to keep it going because they believe. Um, that they deserve, deserve more um, than the uh, poor guy who um, doesn't have um, a greatest job Which as they one do. thing I never understood. I mean, you have everything, you have rich, why do you feel like you need more? <laughs> I know. It's, it's not I... just that. It's also to keep like the public ignorant as well, like uh, Chandler was saying. Yeah, and guys, so like, and then the other mystery that that, you know, how do we, like, all right, uh, again, this this goes into kind of like our view of reality, because in other words, like basically they are the universe, whatever's controlling our thoughts, their thoughts is allowing us to understand that is not allowing them to understand it. I don't get that. You know, it's like, you know, why, why would like and again, I, I tend to view the laws of nature, the universe as as, as kind of like being in quote unquote intelligent enough to have evolved this human brain that, that you know, can understand all that. So like I just can't understand how whatever's controlling things, you know, doesn't allow them to understand that. It's it's really bizarre because you know what, George, like the people, they have they seem to have a need to feel like they're in control of their life but that if that only the only person who would desire that is if everything in their life is fine because if your life is is just totally bad and everything's going wrong you don't want to take responsibility for it you know and so i think it's most here's how it works the the privileged the wealthy the the those people are the you ones. You know, half of them are the ones to cause the trouble. But oh yeah, right. Sorry. They yeah, they want to believe in free will because they feel like their life is up to them and their life is great. So they want to believe that they made their life that way. That's what I think goes on. <laughs> yeah, well, mm -hmm. I can't, I've been known to misphrase things or you know make typos like spelling mistakes, whatever. Like. Uh, you know, and um, I do acknowledge that I do make mistakes sometimes, George, right? But then when, when I make um, some of these, like, misphrasings, I, I confuse some people, don't I? And because I cause some people to become confused, they make assumptions, and then it ends up into an argument. I mean, I can kind of understand where you're coming from when you're saying that... Um, I should phrase things um, and be more careful and pay more attention to what people are saying. And, and Jamie, here's the thing, like, you know, like, you're not in control of how you phrase things. Other people aren't in control of how they understand things. So, like, you know, so under the mm -hmm. free will belief, under the free will belief, you know, people are blaming you. You might be blaming them, but everybody's blaming everybody when yeah. it, that's so delusional. It's so yeah. mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Look, yeah, everyone makes mistakes, Jamie. And so we don't blame you for, for misspelling things or phrasing things wrong. In fact, I do that a lot. 
I don't know if it's autism or what, but I, 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 I make terrible communication errors, and my mom's always picking on me. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. But, you, but like yeah. when I type something to somebody, trust yeah. me, I have, to, I have to edit it out some half the time. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, if we, had a, if we had a free will, why do typos exist? <laughs> yeah. I hate that because I, I like to be a perfectionist sometimes, and I get really frustrated about my spelling mistakes that sometimes I have to remove comments constantly and then put them once I spell something correctly, you know what I mean? Yeah, and seriously, I've published four books, so I know all about typos. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, we, you you probably are, um, don't put your books out until you've corrected all your spelling. You know what I mean? And who knows? That's maybe the way you're to do it. Yeah, and and our world may be too obsessed with getting everything perfect. Where you know you you publish a book, you got twenty typos, big deal. You yeah, know? I mean yeah. twenty out of like how many words? Yeah. Yeah, you know what? Perfect is the enemy of good. No, what <laughs> happened was, what happened about that is studies why for that is because some people will, like, grill you for uh, misspelling anything, you know. Cause some people think, like, you know, because you can't um, read per um, perfectly or, you know, you can't write perfectly. Yeah. You know, well, like, you know, I'm talking about absolutely perfect. Yeah. If you don't get right, some people will um, kill you. And, and guess what? Who defines perfect? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, it's, it's frustrating sometimes when people make assumptions, right? Um... But I do, I do admit that you know, if, if I phrase say it wrong, um, then it it does cause uh, some confusion, doesn't it, George Ortega? Like what you were saying about some other things that I've got into arguments with. Well, again, it's it's not just we all say things, you know, that that lead others to believe something else, and some of it, you know, is is you know based on our misphrasing it. A lot of it is based on their misunderstanding it, and so we all do this absolutely. Like if if we had a free will then we wouldn't make those mistakes. Who would make those kinds of mistakes if we had a free will? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and... it does become frustrating when you have to deal with it, though. I mean, before, before, um, what's it called? I made some uh, posts on Twitter, but before, uh, sorry, not before, after I posted say on, uh, on Twitter uh, and after I removed it, um, I showed Chandler the screenshot of one of the comments that I removed because it might confuse some people. Yeah, right. Uh, and and I think we all do that. We, we you know we, we we write something down. We're understanding what we're saying. Then when we read it again, we're saying, oh wait a minute, you know this might be misunderstood and stuff. Sometimes we don't catch everything. Absolutely. Uh, look, I gotta tell you guys. You know the first book I published, Confessions of a Confused Virgin, recently for my seventh episode, um, at my Antitrust Determinist series. I read parts of that book, and I'm like, who wrote this crap? I said that, I think, because seriously, that book is so full of wrong information, all based on fundamentalist Christianity. It's so wrong, and, and, I, and back then I obviously believed in free will, and I said that God gave you a brain and a choice, and it was so – I was so messed up. And so that – I'm – look, real – People, I'm really sorry for that book I published. It's awful. Because that one verse <laughs> in the Bible where he said everybody can have free will. Yep. It, you exactly. know, it doesn't say that. <laughs> oh, man. But I don't know. I really don't know. I, I really don't know how the doctrine of predestination and that God knows the future and that he can – and that Jesus could predict that Peter would deny him – um, at by the time uh, three times by the time the cock crowed twice, that Jesus can predict the future, but still believe in free will. How can they do that? Like seriously, exactly. <laughs> that's it. Mm -hmm. And again, so like so we were talking before how sometimes there are political reasons. People who've been become very successful, they have big egos. They want to take the credit. They don't want to be humble and modest. So that explains them. But what explains all these, like, you know, um, over half of philosophers 
you know, are compatibilists in the sense they get that everything has a cause, but they have this emotional need to still believe in free will. I mean, may, maybe they're, maybe that's part of it. In other words, maybe like they've gotten PhDs and so they're, they're completely ego driven. They want to take, you know, credit for it. Mm -hmm. So maybe that explains that too. Yeah. And you know what, George, there's one thing that hard determinists and compatibilists have in common is that they both know that libertarian free will is totally gone. They know there's another... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they know that it's totally wrong. That because any anybody with any brains at all really sees that once they see how it's defined. Um, but the compatibilists, like I pointed out earlier in this podcast, your butt can fart of its own free will by compatibilist definitions because no one's holding a gun to its head. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, just like I said before, just like those people where they get um they. Get, you know those people that have those pyramid scheme and um and, and um, prosper on it. Not everybody prospers on those things. It turns out. Yeah, but but as Daniel Dennett would say, luck averages out in the long run. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I'm really sad because at first I thought Daniel Dennett knew what he was talking about, and that is until I found out what he said about free will. <laughs> Guys, you might, you know what might help us out with this? I just got an email recently about a new organization or something that is trying to deal with climate change denial. In other words, basically a lot of times when people deny climate change, they're, they don't understand the science well enough. And so like basically a lot of these, you know, people concerned with climate change are trying to understand how to reach these people. So they, they kind of have the same kind of problem we do, but with a different topic. So, you know, maybe like in the upcoming weeks and months, we might want to explore what they've come up with to, to be able to help people understand mm -hmm. the climate change is happening. And then we can apply those same principles to free will. Or, yeah. they, may say, they, or they may say God's about to come down and um, rap is just playing. Well, so, yeah, I hear point? that all the time. <laughs> too. Will, so, yeah, that's that. another. <laughs> yeah, Will, I hear that all oh, yeah, the, the time. I, Will, I hear that all the time. Well, God's going to just b d destroy this planet anyway, remake it all, so it doesn't the matter. In revelations, man. And, and I'm like, well, you know, it's really, it's really sad because um, it just so happens that those are the majority of people in the world. That's the problem. You know, is they is they like, oh well, it doesn't really matter. There's gonna. It's but, unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah, because all they care about is the afterlife. At, at, you know, they don't care about the here and now and yeah, how it's. Yeah, go up there to all loving God, even though, yeah. even though he sends people to hell to be tortured for all eternity. But he's a loving God. Oh, I know. I've heard that all my life. And <laughs> Will, yeah, and Will, that's one of our big challenges. Because here's the thing, because like 80, 90% of Americans believe in a higher power of God. And if we're telling them that we don't have a free will, what we're telling them from their perspective is that whatever we do, God's accountable for. So in other words, not only, I mean, they, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're comfortable when we give God credit for the good we do. You know, in other words, like, they, they actually, they insist on that. You know, if we do something right, don't. Yeah, but don't, when the head, or something goes wrong, it's the devil. And that's the thing. That's the thing. So like, so, so I think like, that's one of the things we have, we have to, you know, explain to them that, well, yes, I mean, God, you know, it, it's in the Bible, Isaiah, God creates good, God creates evil. Yes, God is not all good, because if God was all good, you know, from their perspective. Devil wouldn't exist. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I brought up that verse to my mom, and, and I think she said it was a misinterpretation or something. I don't know, man, and I don't, I don't know. That's weird. Yeah, uh, but I, I just don't get it, and how is it that the devil, which doesn't have a free will either, by the way, tempts you, and then you're responsible if you do what the devil tempted you to do. I've never gotten that. Yeah, and, and that was, I think... Even all... though he's supposed to have free will, actually, which is why he rebelled against God. Right. Uh, and and yet, yeah, it's crazy, because yeah, if God... Yeah, <laughs> free will, even in the devil's case, doesn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people say, a lot of people say, well, it means you know, it's God's fault. A lot of people say, ride. yeah, a lot of people say, well, <clears throat> free will is such a gift because if we didn't have free will, we couldn't love God of our own free will, not understanding that they also believe in this place called heaven that's, that's populated by angels who can't but love God. You can't be up in, in heaven and hate God, right? So obviously these angels don't have free will, so they don't understand the, 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 um, you know the the incongruity of of their explanation. Ah, yeah, and he, and, yeah. Belief, right? so they don't even realize that they're God's racist because He gives His angels special privileges, right? They get special rights, while humans are used as lab rats. You know, technically speaking. I hear. You. Well, yeah, that's not the only way in which God is racist, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and will also like you know with, with augustine i mean like augustine could have said fine like we can't blame god because he believed god is all good so he's fine we can't blame god for the evil. why is the way that you should have said why is the world the way it is why is this shit all all right all right and, and <laughs> augustine could have blamed satan could have said listen it's not our fault because we don't have a free will you who know who created like satan yeah why is it only humans have um, eternal souls why not animals yeah, that's my main thing, because I've tried to tell people, well, why then do, do mosquitoes have souls? And they're like, well, well, no, we'll prove that mosquitoes don't have souls. Because, because if the mosquitoes have souls and they accept Jesus before they die or something, or God has predestined the mosquitoes to go to heaven, you're going to be, you're going to have mosquitoes tormenting you in heaven. I yeah. mean, seriously. <laughs> I hear you. And fucking roaches and bed bugs. You know, those fucking pain me ass insects hey, again. You're fucking trying to eat you. <laughs> and hey, George, why did Augustine be believe that God was all good anyway? Because that's not biblical. And and with and with mosquitoes and other things that are bugs complete... that are completely fucking useless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to believe that yeah, God's all good, but ha created these things that serve no purpose but to hurt things. <laughs> No, I hear you. I hear you. And, and again, like, you know, I, you know, unlike a lot of scientists, I'm a pantheist in the sense that, like, I attribute intelligence to the universe. So in other words, like, because we don't have a free will, remember when we were like kids and we played with, with soldiers and we made one soldier do something and made the other soldier like a react and like we're kind of like orchestrating everything. It seems like the universe, call it whatever you want to call it, is is like is using us in that way. And then the question in my mind becomes like, well, you know, is the universe like sadistic? I mean, why does the universe create so many problems for us? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, don't worry. Which means, you know, our pain is going to end one day. You know what I mean? We're, we don't live forever. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Where everybody's heading their same destination. Yeah. You know what's funny about that? That means that that means that luck averages out in the long run. <laughs> Because we're all gonna die. There you go. <laughs> That's the only way in which Daniel Dennett's right. Either for natural causes or some freak accident due to a person or some kind of national, uh, some kind of um nature event or whatever. Yeah. Actually, but maybe maybe our our next episode we can explore what we believe if anything happens, you know, after we die, and like you know, what are the what are the um implications of that, you know? That sounds, yeah, that sounds like an excellent topic for another podcast. Yeah. Um, well, you might have the same opinion about me, um, George, on this. I mean, you might think that it's possible for, you know, um, our consciousness to um, be reborn in a new physical body after this one. You know? I mean, yeah. I, I know I, one thing. I wouldn't want, if I get reincarnated, please don't bring back in this shithole life. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, That's the I, only thing. There's so many galaxies. There's billions of galaxies. There's got to be like... Oh, galaxies, universes. This universe is shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Jamie, I'm really... Jamie, I'm really scared of the idea of reincarnation because here's what occurred to me, that if reincarnation was true, okay, I could be reborn as a mosquito, a cockroach, a slug, and be... Or worse, a dung beetle? Yeah, yeah, and be stepped on over and over. I mean, seriously, that's worse than hell. <laughs> yeah. Living like living like eating nothing, doing nothing but eating shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. like like yeah. flies, Fish, piranha and stuff like that. Yep. Oh yeah, so that's totally a, a topic for another podcast about uh, is an afterlife possible? 
Um, we've been going for about 35 minutes. Should we end, end this one and then do a different one? Sounds good. All right. You've been listening to Free Will, Science, and Religion. We hope you've enjoyed this interesting um, comparison between determinism and fatalism, as well as some of the other topics that we uh, branched out onto without intention. <laughs> okay.